For residents of Hong Kong, the Sunday foreign domestic worker protests felt like it was just part of the routine. Foreign domestic workers, usually just referred to as helpers, protested their living and working conditions out in the streets back in 2017. Even though International Women's Day, March 8th, rolled around on a Wednesday that year, the female protesters still marched on Sunday. They protested on Sunday for the same reason they couldn't protest on Wednesday. Their employers only give them one day off per week, Sunday. If they miss a day, just one day, they may just lose their jobs. The migrant worker situation in Hong Kong is one of the most dire in the world. A perfect recipe of powerful people taking advantage of poor migrants who have no other choice but to work the way their bosses want them to work, like indentured servants. Hong Kong has always been a cultural melting pot. Given its former status as a British colony and its location in the center of East Asia, people from all around the globe start new lives in Hong Kong. The city has also benefited from economic prosperity over the decades, making it a promised land for those looking for a better life. The majority population is still ethnic Chinese, but the city is home to everyone else, like American investment bankers, academics from India who teach at the university, and many other groups. The largest group of minorities come from the Philippines. The local government calls them foreign domestic helpers. The helpers are the name given specifically to Filipino migrants, but almost all helpers members are women from the Philippines. The most striking part of the acronym, as you may have noticed, is the H. Why are the Filipino migrants classified as helpers? Hong Kong uses the term helpers because that is exactly how the city treats them, as the help of Hong Kong. The migrants are hired by individuals, families and corporations to perform menial tasks, such as cooking, cleaning and nannying, or all of them combined. These jobs are demanding and require the female foreign domestic helper to work under little regulation. This means that the conditions and pay aren't heavily regulated by employee rights laws, so their employers can work them virtually any way they want. You might be asking why they don't bring the rest of their family to Hong Kong. After all, it would be much easier if their family could come and help support themselves. Unfortunately, that's not possible. The government prohibits them from bringing the rest of their family to Hong Kong. For that reason, the only thing foreign migrant workers can do is work as helpers and send money back to the Philippines. And due to their status, they are virtually stuck in the jobs the helpers provide. Since helpers are essentially foreign workers, they naturally don't have the same rights as Hong Kong nationals. But the government in Hong Kong goes even further than that. For example, in the US, foreign workers are given rights regarding working conditions and wages. Things such as overtime pay and vacation time still apply. But for the women from the Philippines in Hong Kong, no such rights exist. The violations begin upon entry into the country, where foreign migrant workers are given a warm welcome consisting of sky-high fees. Earlier, we had mentioned that the helpers are like indentured servants. That wasn't an exaggerated analogy. Upon arriving in Hong Kong, the helpers are met with a fee that takes out 10% of their first monthly wage from the receiving agency that admits them into the city. Except most of these agencies charge way more than 10%. On average, the agency charges the helpers in a Anywhere from 5,000 to 7,000 Hong Kong dollars, which translates to around 650 to 900 US dollars. Meanwhile, the average minimum monthly wage paid to helpers is roughly 550 US dollars per month. Some agencies also charge additional fees for job training, which is illegal. Of course, if the foreign workers don't pay the fee, they don't get the job in Hong Kong, and they don't get to send any money back to their family in the Philippines. Unfortunately, almost none of the workers coming from the Philippines have anything close to $700 in Hong Kong currency. To pay the fees, helpers are deferred to loan specialist companies working with the agencies. These specialist companies in turn provide the helpers with the amount they need, but for a hefty price, ridiculously high interest rates. The interest rates on these loans can reach as high as 48% and as low as 30%. These rates are beyond anything other immigrants and residents of Hong Kong have to pay. And the only way helpers can ever hope to pay the specialist companies back is by working in Hong Kong. If the entry into Hong Kong was bad, actually working there is even worse. For starters, there aren't many rules for employers of helpers, but one is that they must provide a living space within their home, which can be both good 
and bad, mostly bad thing for the helpers. Some of the helpers have reported small living spaces and lack of freedom from within their employers' homes. It also means their employers can make them work marathon-like hours. A study in 2016 found some shocking evidence for overworking. They reported that 63% of helpers worked 72-plus hour work weeks and around 12% worked 90-plus hour work weeks. Compared to the world average, as well as what many consider the standard work week of 40 hours, the helpers are working extreme hours. Some have compared the ridiculously long hours and constrained living conditions to being trapped. For some, the comparison is a reality. One helper named Nilda claims her employer installed CCTV cameras inside her bedroom to monitor her activity and make sure she was working during work hours, which was pretty much all day. The living spaces in Hong Kong are famously small, even for the wealthy and middle class, so it's even more shocking to discover that Nilda shares the monitored bedroom with her employer's baby. Nilda's situation sounds deplorable, but she's one of the more fortunate helpers. Many of the Hong Kong residents who hire helpers don't have extra rooms for them to stay. According to a researcher in Hong Kong who interviewed several helpers, many foreign domestic workers are forced to sleep in their employer's living room or the kitchen or, in the most dire cases, the bathroom. The researcher also notes that the helpers can't go outside during working hours, which is almost every hour of every day. Hence the reason Nilda's employers wanted to enforce this unwritten rule so strictly they installed a camera in her bedroom. Under these conditions, many helpers are only given one day off to handle their personal care and leisure time. Sunday on Sundays, many helpers from all over the city gather at churches for mass, then meet up afterwards. Some protest, but others simply spend time with other helpers from the Philippines and other parts of Southeast Asia. One helper named Chabordo said she met her group after finding them on an online fan club for Filipino pop duo Jadeen called Jadeen Lovers HK. They regularly meet under colorful banners with their club name, often next to other helpers picnicking, giving each other haircuts and protesting. These helper gatherings are usually referred to as assemblies and have been going on for several decades. There, they protest their poor working conditions, their lack of freedom, proper housing, food, clothing and livable wage. In central Hong Kong, helpers pitch tents and lay out the sides of cardboard boxes which act as makeshift seats that soften the concrete and asphalt they sit upon. This is where the assemblies usually take place. Over the years, several organizations have recognized the migrants' plight for reform. But, so far, little change has occurred. For the most part, helpers have received little attention from the media and haven't gotten much help from the international community, with the exception of Erwiana Sulistia Ningsi. Back in 2014, The Guardian, a major British news outlet, reported a story on Erwiana describing allegations that she'd been mistreated by her employers. Erwiana's employers were, of course, Hong Kong nationals hiring her to be a live-in caretaker. The Guardian outlined the case which featured descriptions of mistreatment inflicted on Erwiana by her employers. The details were made public by the release of a collection of photos depicting the many injuries Erwiana sustained from her employers. Due to content guidelines, we can't show or describe the details of Erwiana's injuries, but just know some of the injuries were severe and shocking enough to get the attention of The Guardian. Erwiana also said that her employers enforced a strict sleep schedule that only only allowed her four hours of sleep on work nights. As you can imagine, locals in Hong Kong are more than aware of the issue, where it receives local media attention. The protests, in particular, get a lot of coverage, even though they happen almost on a weekly basis. But after the Erwiana case hit the news cycle, the local media and the protests were kicked into a whole new gear. Thousands of protesters, including several civil rights groups, protested throughout the streets of Hong Kong. Overnight, Erwiana and her plight became a major socio-political issue. Her case was brought to the very front of the Hong Kong police force's attention, and they immediately began looking for Erwiana's former employer. They caught the employer, a woman ironically named Lo Wang Tang, just in time. Wang Tang was at the Hong Kong International Airport on her way to board a flight to Thailand when the Hong Kong police arrested her. Later, the police charged Wang Tang in a Kuntong court, a district 
court in Hong Kong with several charges, such as common assault, criminal intimidation, grievous bodily harm, and assault causing bodily harm. Several other charges were added on until the total ran up to 20. Of those 20 charges, Wan Tang was found guilty of 18 of them. The court later sentenced her to six years in prison, though she only ended up serving three and a half years of her sentence after being released on parole. She may have gotten off easy, by most standards. But if Erwiana's case hadn't gone viral, it's very likely her employer would have gotten away with the mistreatment like so many others before her. Erwiana's story didn't end or even fix the issue at large, though she should absolutely be commended for her bravery. Helpers are still struggling to obtain their rights. Because of the continuing problem, Erwiana has become the face of change for the migrant worker community. The media agreed. In 2014, the same year Ariana came forward to the Hong Kong police, Time magazine included Ariana in their 100 Most Powerful People issue. When she found out about the mention in Time, Ariana says she was surprised and maintained her original intent with coming forward, that with her statements, she hoped Hong Kong would stop taking advantage of young female migrant workers. However, Ariana and her influence on the issue can't dismantle an entire system all on its own. That is why the current helpers continue to protest, even though little change has occurred over the past few decades. Estimates of how many helpers there are in Hong Kong vary, but most numbers on the issue range from 300 to 400,000 helpers. In 2019, for example, a study estimated there were around 400,000 helpers working within Hong Kong. Earlier, we mentioned agencies that funnel the women who will eventually become helpers into Hong Kong. These agencies are almost solely responsible for creating the system that exploits the young women from the Philippines looking for a better life. The agencies have posted big poster ads throughout the city, advertising to local Hong Kong residents that they can hire helpers for little money, but receive extensive services in return. The ads are usually designed with bright colors and depict an illustration of a cheerful, smiling helper. Back in the Philippines, these agencies have installed correspondents in offices in local areas. The correspondents offer reel in young women with promises of high wages in Hong Kong that they can use to support their families back home. Interestingly enough, the agencies are all accredited by the Philippines consulate, so there is no support for these women from the Filipino government. They did take away the correspondence officer's ability to take high commissions from the women they employ, but other than that, they have done little else to regulate the system. None of this is to absolve the government of Hong Kong from any responsibility. The only reason the agencies can ship these women from the Philippines to Hong Kong as modern-day indentured servants is because the governments of both Hong Kong and the Philippines do not properly regulate the agencies. These failures have led many protesters and critics of Hong Kong to accuse the city of treating helpers as second-class citizens, especially in regards to the minimum wage. The minimum wage for helpers is what allows their services to be so cheap for residents of Hong Kong. The statutory minimum wage in Hong Kong, that being the standard minimum wage enforced across the city, most local laborers in Hong Kong would earn around $700 per week in US dollars. Meanwhile, the average helper only earns roughly $600 US dollars per month. Over the years, the Hong Kong government has raised and decreased the minimum wage for helpers as well as taken away and given rights. Though the minimum wage for foreign domestic workers has overall gotten higher, they are obviously still getting paid significantly less than a regular resident of Hong Kong would get paid otherwise. The only hope for helpers lies in figures such as Erwiana and other activist groups who bring awareness to the issue and force the governments involved to properly regulate the system or abolish it altogether. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section if you think the foreign domestic helper arrangement in Hong Kong should be legal or illegal.